Dear distinguished guests, members of the ECPR Executive Committee, dear vice rectors of the Charles University, colleagues and friends from Prague and abroad, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of us local organizers, welcome to the 10th General Conference of the European Consortium for Political Research held at the Charles University in Prague. I'm standing here in front of you today, wishing to extend the gratitude of us from the Prague team to all those with a special thanks to the ECPR standing or central services who helped us along the long two years during which this conference was in the making. Please know that we have appreciated and continue to appreciate your guidance and assistance greatly. Conference as large as this is always a team play, and hence while standing here in the magnificent Smetana Hall of the Municipal House, I wish to take a moment to thank also my colleagues, Petr and Tomasz, as well as our three doctoral students, Aleš, Ilona and Michal, and the over 70 student volunteers in the red t-shirts all over the three venues. Our warmest gratitude goes also to the city of Prague uh, for enabling us to host this plenary in this wonderful setting, so thank you. It is only for the second time that the ECPR General Conference is held in Central, or as some may call it, East Central Europe. This conference takes place around a time significant for the region, a quarter of a century ago, countries including the then Czechoslovakia held their first democratic elections. It was also around this time that the Faculty of Social Sciences that our Institute of Political Studies is a part of came into being. When placing a bid uh, to organize a general conference in Prague, one of our principal aims was not only to bring you ECPR to Central Europe, but what is more also to highlight the importance of Central or East Central Europe, including the challenges the region offers for scholars such as you. The introduction of direct presidential elections in the Czech Republic in 2012 and the president who came out of them, the rise of mainstream populism, including the rather hysterical responses to the so-called refugee crisis in a country with virtually no refugees, brought about many new questions about the nature of this country and about its character. Are we witnessing a decline of liberal democracy? Was the Václav Havel legacy that we like to talk about in Prague only a convenient bubble for the liberal elites? And also, why do many scholars outside this region argue that the Czech Republic turned into a semi-presidential regime, while many academics within the region dismiss this characterization rather passionately. So who are we? What is Central Europe? And what does make Central Europe? Please join us in discussions on these and other questions while walking around the three venues, getting immersed not only in the beauty of Prague, but also in the so many fascinating papers presented here in Prague. We from the Prague Local Organizing Committee wish you a successful conference, an enjoyable state, and many happy returns, not only to ECPR general conferences, but also to Charles University and Prague. It is now my pleasure It is now my pleasure to introduce a man behind Charles University's research, Professor Jan Konvalinka, the Vice Rector of Charles University for Research. Please, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's indeed my great pleasure and honor 
and the privilege to have a chance to welcome you here on behalf of His Magnificence, uh, Rector Magnificus, uh, Professor Tomáš Zima. He unfortunately could not be present today and I will have a difficult task of uh, replacing him. We are, as a Charles University, indeed uh, honored to have a chance to organize uh, the 10th uh, annual ECPR conference in Prague. Uh, and I'm really grateful to my colleagues from the Institute of uh, Politological Studies in the Faculty of Social Sciences and to our colleagues from the Faculty of Philosophy to take this difficult task of organizing it. Uh, you might know that Charles University is uh, one of the, or probably the oldest university in this part of Europe. We like to think also uh, the best uh, in this part of Europe. Uh, north of Alps and east of Rhine. Uh, it's a big university. We have 50,000 students. We have 70 faculties. So you can imagine how difficult my job as a vice rector for research is to handle five faculties of medicine and three faculties of theology, ladies and gentlemen. So the politology is, 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 is just fun. Uh, I am myself a biochemist and I work on uh, HIV research, so I can't really complain that my own field of research would be uh, not impactful enough. But looking around uh, what's going on in Europe and in the world during the last few years, I must admit that uh, politology and probably sociology seems to be a much more fascinating area of research than, than biochemistry or virology or, or AIDS research, and I kind of envy you, and uh, I encourage my uh, uh, actually kids and uh, their schoolmates to, to study social sciences because that's really exciting part of, of uh, human endeavor these days. Because I don't understand what's going on, and I, I, per I really deeply hope that you guys do, and because you know, let me be personal, 25 years ago, I was a student taking part of uh, the students' so-called Velvet Revolution that helped to overthrow the communist regime in this country. And with the Berlin Wall falling down, falling down, we believed that history was over, that the major problems are solved, and now the remaining problems will be same-sex marriage and uh, uh, VAT attacks, and that's about it. We were wrong. History is not over, and uh, things are much more complicated than we thought they would be. And uh, I really look forward whether you would be able at least to address some of the problems that are not here in this region only, but also in the rest of Europe, also overseas in the United States. Uh, understand and analyze what's going on and why is it going on. I have a very distinguished uh, colleague, a physical chemist, who keeps saying, I'm not looking for answers, I'm looking for questions. And uh, it's a very good thing in physical chemistry. I don't think that you have to look for questions. We have them enough. And I wish you all the best uh, with finding at least some of the answers. Let me conclude with uh, ancient greeting that, that the university events the rectors and vice rectors would use when they wanted to especially bless the event they would open, uh, which is wishing all the best and all the good luck and all the goodwill and uh, uh, all the happiness in your proceedings. Quod bonum Felix Faustum Fortunatum Que Evenia. And now I would like to welcome uh, a man behind this organization uh, that is helping to hopefully answer some of the questions, although probably raise many more as well. Uh, Professor Rudy Anderweg, please, Rudy. Mr. Vice Rector, dear participants, 
As chair of the ECPR, I welcome you all to this, the 10th ECPR General Conference. With well over 2,000 registered participants, this is the largest ECPR General Conference so far. And it shows that ECPR continues to contribute to the development of European political science. There will be cynics who will attribute the high attendance to the fact that Prague is one of the main tourist attractions of Europe. Indeed, we are here in one of Europe's most beautiful cities, with its many museums and monuments, and I do hope that you will take some time, not too much, but some time, to sample them. But for us political scientists, I think that the political history of this country and this city also contribute to the attraction. From being the capital of the Duchy of Bohemia in the 9th century, to being the capital of the Holy Roman Empire, to being the capital of the Czech Republic, Prague has witnessed many fierce political conflicts. But today, the Czech Republic is also the sixth most peaceful country in the world, according to the Global Peace Index. And terms such as the Velvet Revolution of 1989 and the Velvet Divorce of 1993 testify to that. Conflict and conflict resolution, a great inspiration for a gathering of political scientists. That political history of the country and the city is also reflected in the history of this great university. It is the 17th oldest still existing, existing university in the world. But there has even been some dispute about the exact founding date, depending on your preference for either a secular founding father, in this case the Emperor Charles IV, or a clerical founding father, Pope Clement VI. And in its history, the university has seen splits and mergers as a result of religious conflicts and linguistic tension. But, this, you, <clears throat> but throughout all that political turbulence, the university continued to include among its students and its academics many political leaders, such as the first president of Czechoslovakia, Tomasz Garek Masaryk, famous authors such as Franz Kafka and Milan Kundera, and many great scholars, including Nobel Prize winners. Perhaps not so widely known, one of the great masters of our own profession, Karl Deutsch, studied law and obtained a PhD in political science here in 1938. It is a great honor indeed that we can have our conference here at such a distinguished university in such beautiful buildings in such a great and interesting city. And if that is not enough, take a look at our conference program. Again, we have an exciting mix of today's plenary lecture by Professor Rogers Brubaker of four roundtables, seven featured panels, 68 sections with a total of 478 panels, not even mentioning the book exhibit and all the meetings of ECPR standing groups in between. I think that I can speak on behalf of all of you when I thank all those who have been involved in putting this program together and making this conference possible. Here in the municipal house, I particularly want to thank the city of Prague for providing free travel passes for the duration of the conference to all participants. I also thank Sandra Thompson and her team at ECPR Central Services and Klaus Gutz and Maurizio Carbone of the ECPR's executive committee. But above all, our gratitude is to the local organizers at the Institute of Political Studies at, of Charles University, to its director, Peter, Peter Jupter, to Tomasz Karasek, to Hanna Kubatova, and to all their collaborators and their assistants. And now it gets tricky. Organizovat ICPR konferenci neni lehki ukol. Ja bih rad podekoval za nas všechny za pozvání do Prahy. Díky taky panu vicerektorovi Janu Konvalinkovi za pěti na Karlové univerzitě a za jeho přítomnost zde. Well, any complaints about my check should be addressed to Petr Kopecki, my colleague at Leiden University, who wrote this. 
But above all, I wish the whole ECPR family gathered here in Prague an inspiring, a productive, and an enjoyable, enjoyable general conference. I now invite my colleague on the Executive Committee, Professor Mary Farrell, to present a new prize in the list of ECPR awards, the EPS Prize. I would like to add that we shall be introducing yet another prize shortly, the ECPR Hadley Bull Award for the best book in the field of international relations. But that is for the future. For now, the EPS Prize, and the floor is yours, Mary. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, the European Political Science Prize is awarded for the best article published in the EPS journal during 2015. And the prize is supported by EPS publishers, Paul Grave Macmillan. On behalf of ECPR, I would like to thank the publishers for their su continued support to the journal and indeed for supporting the prize itself. And uh, while I'm here, I would like to also take the opportunity to thank the editors of EP, uh, EPS for their sterling efforts to support and grow the journal. And that's thanks to Daniel Stockmere, Ekaterina Rashkova, and Alistair Blair. And uh, in case they don't know, their efforts are very greatly appreciated by everybody, uh, especially by me. Um, the selection panel for uh, the prize comprised Professor Dude Dallerup, uh, Chair of the panel, University of Stockholm, Professor James Newell, University of Salford, and Professor Gianfranco Paschino, University of Bologna. And we're very grateful to uh, the panel for taking the time uh, to go through um, the, the entries. Um, this year's winner uh, of the EPS Prize is Dr. Alexander Schmutz for his article entitled Vulnerability and Compensation, Constructing an Index of Co-optation in Autocratic Regimes. Um, uh, Dr. Schmutz is based at the Department of War Studies King's College London, and he holds a PhD from Humboldt University in Berlin. Now, uh, the winning article actually forms output from his current research program, and he um, is also contributing an article, a chapter, I should say, in an OUP edited volume entitled Handbook of Transformation. I suppose we, we should recognize, in terms of uh, this particular article, that it really forms um, you know, a current contribution to a, a research agenda which has been around for quite some time, the, the study of authoritarian regimes. And as the Vice Director of Research um, observed in his introductory remarks, you know, the, the story is ongoing. Um, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Schmoltz's article is very much part of that. Um, I should say that the EPS Prize is awarded for the article that the judges consider to make A, a significant contribution to the field of political science, B, uh, a contribution that helps in understanding new and innovative trends in political science, and see uh, innovative approaches to teaching and learning in the profession. And I think in many respects, the winning article um, meets in some way or other all of, of these uh, three criteria. Uh, the judges in their report uh, recognized uh, the significance of the article in, in these various ways. And uh, their comment was that the article takes a broader view of co-optation so as to develop an index of how co-optation is manifested in autocratic regimes. Um, they also observed that the index is based on indicators of vulnerability and of compensation for a variety of pressure groups. Uh, the author uh, looks at a, a number of pressure groups 
including landowners, capital, labor, the military, and, and ethnic groups, uh, and then tests the index on models of survival or breakdown of autocratic regimes. In, in uh, Schmoltz's words, uh, in his conclusion, he says, this article presented a comprehensive concept and operationalization of co-optation in autocratic regimes. The concept is based on the idea that co-optation is compensation of the regime's vulnerability to threats posed by particularly powerful groups in society. And he argues that the regime's vulnerability to each of these groups is a function of their respective group capacity and political ambition. Strong and ambitious groups need to be targeted with material benefits and offered institutional inclusion in exchange for their cooperation. Cooptation is achieved when compensation efforts are adequate to particular pressure group vulnerability. Now, he does uh, also um, uh, suggest that, well, um, you know, there is sort of some more work to be done in terms of the index. But I think it's a really interesting article, and it does uh, indeed, uh, you know, point us towards thinking about, you know, current autocratic regimes and even looking at some of the, the sort of uh, ongoing situations around the world. So indeed, the story is not over. But I think this is a really interesting contribution to, to the literature. Finally, um, just to say that Dr. Schmoltz is, is not actually here this evening to, to receive his prize. He's on his way to Prague. So, um, but we uh, will present the prize to him formally uh, on Saturday morning um, at the Meet the Editors session, uh, which will be 12.45 in room FL412. So if you're around at that time, then I invite you to come along to the session. Thank you. And now it is my both great pleasure and honor to introduce a man that when we got the call that we can invite a guest speaker was um, a name that we didn't even hope for to come to Prague. Um, an inspiration for many of us in this room and, and at our institute, Professor Rogers Brubaker, who is a professor of sociology and UCLA Foundation Chair at the University of California, Los Angeles. As I probably don't need to introduce him, he written widely on topics such as social theory, immigration, citizenship, nationalism, ethnicity, and religion. His recent books include Ethnicity Without Groups, published by Harvard University Press, Nationalist Politics and Everyday Ethnicity in a Transylvanian Town, Princeton University Press, Grounds for Difference, Harvard University Press, and Fresh Out of Print, I heard, Trans, Gender, Race, and the Micropolitics of Identity. I know we all are interested more in his talk, so I will cut this short and welcome him Thank him once again for coming to Prague. Rogers, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna, for that very gracious introduction, and more importantly, for your kind invitation, which I was only too happy uh, to accept. Uh, let me join Anna in thanking uh, her colleagues um, at Charles University and also uh, Sandra Thompson and the ECPR Executive Committee as well as the City of Prague for allowing us to gather in this extraordinary venue. The question of the religious dimensions of political conflict and violence is today hard to escape. The question is especially hard to escape in the realm of public discussion. But it's also an increasingly prominent question in the social and political sciences. 
political scientists, specialists in the study of conflict and violence, yet long strikingly uninterested in religious phenomena, have found religion with a vengeance in the last decade or so, while specialists in the study of religion, sociologists, anthropologists, historians, and others, have become increasingly interested in conflict and violence. So you see a convergence here, and the reasons for this convergence are obvious. Both developments were responding to the resurgence of what Jose Casanova has called public religion, that is, politically active and contentious forms of religious engagement in a range of settings in which religion had been prevailingly understood as a private matter, but more specifically, of course, shifting intellectual agendas reflect such developments as the shock of the Iranian revolution, the rise of politically active fundamentalist movements in all major religious traditions, and the prominent implication of religion in a spate of civil wars and terrorist campaigns. The question of the religious dimensions of political conflict and violence continues to insist itself into relevance, brought into focus by the headlines with depressing regularity, though one should note that Western news coverage tends to dwell on violence in the West while giving comparatively scant and superficial attention to the vastly larger scale carnage produced by religiously grounded or religiously informed conflicts elsewhere. So how should we understand the religious dimensions of political conflict and political violence? There are two broad ways of thinking about this. One view, I'll call this the particularizing view, sees religiously grounded conflict and violence as sui generis, with a distinctive logic or causal texture. This view takes religious claims seriously, maybe too seriously. The alternative generalizing view is that what appears to be religiously inspired conflict and violence is best subsumed under political conflict and violence in general, or perhaps under the abstract rubric of politicized ethnicity. On this second view, religious claims are likely to be masking other more important causal factors. Religion is at best incidental to the logic or causal texture of the conflict or violence. Now, in my view, these stances need not be mutually exclusive. That is, we can bring into analytical focus both the distinctiveness of religiously informed political conflict and the ways in which many conflicts involving religiously identified claimants are fundamentally similar in structure and dynamics to conflicts involving other culturally or ethnically defined claimants. So I'm going to begin with the generalizing stance, but I'll devote most of my lecture to specifying some of the distinctive ways in which religion is implicated in political conflict and violence, that is to the particularizing approach. And I do this because I think, not rather because I think the particularizing approach is superior, but precisely because it's less well-developed. The generalizing stance is clear, it's well-defined, the particularizing stance is not. And the strongest and clearest particularizing statements, that is those that propose the strongest forms of what you might call religious exceptionalism, these are simply untenable. So the challenge, as I see it, is to develop a more nuanced account of the distinctive ways in which religion can enter into political conflict and violence. Now I want to address at the very beginning a potential objection to this whole analytical strategy, namely that religion and religious are hopelessly inadequate as analytical categories. They're better understood as essentially contested categories of practice. On this understanding, religion as such does not exist. What exists and what may sustain, enable, or justify political violence in some contexts, what exists are particular practices, particular discourses, particular structures that are understood by some practitioners as religious though in many cases their religious legitimacy may be vehemently denied by others claiming religious authority. Now, I'm very sympathetic to this position. A fuller treatment, a more rigorous treatment, would have to forego 
the use of religion or religious as categories of analysis or at least be much more self-reflexive and self-critical about defining and using these deeply contested categories. But given the exploratory nature of this discussion, I'm willing to work this evening with a relatively casual and admittedly imprecise notion of religion as long as we keep in mind that this designates not any kind of unitary thing but a loosely related set of practices, discourses, and structures for which religious sanction is claimed by some participants. So let me begin then with the generalizing stance that treats religion as simply one of a number of functionally equivalent bases of identity and mobilization. This stance developed in, this, in the context of the study of ethnicity, and I want to distinguish, distinguish here two strands of work. The first goes back to the late Frederick Barth's influential introduction to ethnic groups and boundaries half a century ago. Barth uh, called for redirecting attention from observable patterns of shared culture, including religion, to the categorical distinctions that organize and channel social interaction. The nature and the dynamics of such boundaries, Barth argued, could be studied without regard to what he somewhat dismissively and to his later regret called the cultural stuff, that is the patterns of cultural similarity and difference. In Barth's words, the critical focus of investigation becomes the ethnic boundary that defines the group, not the cultural stuff that it encloses. So that's one strand of work that was at the origin of this generalizing stance. The second strand of work uh, emerged from efforts in the 70s and 80s to make sense of the surge of political mobilization on the basis of putatively primordial identities, language, race, religion, caste, tribe, or indigeneity in particular. Ethnicity was constituted as an object of study in this line of work by abstracting from the specificities of language, of religion, of other ascriptive markers such as phenotype, region of origin, customary mode of livelihood, and by then reducing these to their common denominator as markers of identity and difference and bases of solidarity. Joseph Rothschild was one of the most sophisticated proponents of this line of work, and it's worth noting in this venue that he was also, as many of you will know, one of the most sophisticated analysts of East Central European society and politics. According to Rothschild, it would be pointless to try to separate out the notion of ethnic consciousness, solidarity, and assertiveness from religious, linguistic, racial, and other so-called primordial foci of consciousness, solidarity, and assertiveness. If this were to be done, Rothschild continued, it is difficult to see what precisely would be meant by the residual notion of ethnicity and ethnic groups. So whether political entrepreneurs mobilize along the lines of religion or language or race, according to Rothschild, is, and I quote, intrinsically irrelevant since any and every one of them can be sacralized into a symbolic focus of ethnic mobilization and politicization. And this process is more or less the same whichever marker criterion is selected. So that was Rothschild. So the Barthian study of ethnic boundaries in anthropology and the political science study of politicized ethnicity initially developed independently of one another, but they have sub subsequently converged. Barth and his immediate followers uh, were concerned with social organization, while political scientists were concerned with political mobilization and claims making, but both lines of work treated ethnicity as a culturally empty form. That is, both lines of work discounted culture. What mattered was not how difference and identity were culturally constructed, but rather how they were socially organized and politically expressed. As a result, work in this tradition, this generalizing tradition, subsumes religion, along with race, caste, kinship, region, language, indigeneity, nationality, and so on, under the abstract, culturally empty notion of ethnicity. Now, religion never comes into analytical focus in this tradition. It's not that the work starts with politicized religion and then makes a case for subsuming it 
under a broader conceptual or theoretical rubric. Rather, this work starts with ethnicity, which it defines broadly enough then to embrace religion. Religion is never at the center of analytical attention. Now, in the remainder of my lecture, I'm going to start with politicized religion rather than with politicized ethnicity. And I'll consider some possibly distinctive ways in which religion can inform and inflect political conflict. I'm going to consider first how religion can define the stakes of conflict, and then secondly, how it can shape what I call the modalities and mechanisms of conflict. So let me start with the stakes of conflict. Conflicts involving religiously identified parties or claimants need not involve necessarily religiously defined stakes. That is, they may be simply conflicts over political power, economic resources, symbolic recognition, cultural reproduction, or national self-determination. And this is what makes it possible and fruitful to subsume religion for certain purposes under the rubric of politicized ethnicity. So for example, in Northern Ireland, the parties to the conflict are often identified as Catholics, Protestants, but the stakes of the conflict are not religious. Same holds for the conflict between Muslims, Orthodox Serbs, and Catholic Croats in the former Yugoslavia. And to a considerable extent, though here one needs to qualify this, this holds also for the contemporary conflicts between Shiites and Sunnis in Iraq and elsewhere, or between Alawites and Sunnis in Syria, though these contemporary cases involve both basically ethno-political conflicts over who owns the state, as my former colleague Andreas Wimmer put it, and conflicts with distinctively religious stakes, pitting some religiously militant Sunnis against other Sunnis as well as against Shiites and Alawites. But in other contexts, one can't assimilate religious to ethno-political conflict. And so here it's important to distinguish the boundary defining or group constituting aspect of religion, identifying some group which then makes claims which may have nothing to do with religion, the boundary defining or group constituting aspect of religion from the normative ordering power intrinsic to many forms of religious life. So it's the boundary def defining aspect that allows us to treat religion for certain purposes as a form of politicized ethnicity, but the normative ordering power of religious traditions points to the distinctively religious stakes of some political conflicts. So let me say a word about this normative ordering power and how it can generate distinctively religious stakes of political conflicts. Religious understandings of right order exist on a variety of different levels, personal, familial, communal, societal, and cosmic. In many traditions of serious or demanding religiosity, the forms of right order or disorder at these various levels are understood to be closely interconnected. So common to what can loosely be called fundamentalist currents in many religious traditions, for example, is the argument that disorder in the family contributes to disorder in wider communal, societal, and political spheres. And this helps explain the priority accorded in these traditions of demanding religiosity, these fundamentalist traditions, the priority accorded to restoring right order in the sphere of family and sexuality, and to countering, for example, the evils of feminism, unregulated sexuality, divorce, or lack of respect for paternal or husbandly authority. So political projects and claims like these, which arise from distinctively religious understandings of right order, cannot be subsumed under a paradigm of politicized ethnicity. This is not because of the intensity of the conflict. Ethnic and nationalist conflicts can be every bit as intense. It's because conflict turns on the question of how we should live, not just on questions like recognition, resources, and opportunities for cultural reproduction that are essential to political ethnicity. Ethnic identities may be as deeply felt as religious identities, but they are normatively thin. They have far fewer implications for the substantive regulation of personal, familial, or public life. 
Today, the most salient religiously driven political conflicts over the substantive regulation of public life turn on claims for the implementation of Sharia, which have been central to political contestation throughout much of the Muslim world since the 1970s. What Robert Hefner has called Sharia politics, that is, struggles over the place and authority of Sharia in society, assume widely varying forms, as do understandings of what Sharia means in contemporary contexts. But despite all this variety, the regulation of gender, sexuality, and family is almost always at stake in such conflicts as are questions of religious freedom and relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. Outside the Muslim world, religiously driven political conflicts likewise pivot on the regulation of gender, sexuality, and the family. Conflicts over the substantive regulation of public life in the United States, for example, arise from the Christian rights efforts to ban abortion, prohibit gay marriage, restrict access to contraception, restore school prayer, and require the teaching of creationism or intelligent design in schools. Similar conflicts arise from ultra-Orthodox Jewish claims in Israel, claims that public buses not run on Saturdays, that sex segregation be observed in public spaces in their neighborhoods, that sex segregated bus lines serve their communities, and that sex segregation be preserved at the Western Wall. Now, religion is, of course, not the only source of claims about the right ordering of public life. The exhaustion of communism and fascism has reduce the salience of conflict driven by comprehensive secular ideological commitments, but moral crusades, social movements, and other forms of political contestation continue to be driven by secular, as well as, of course, religiously informed moral commitments and understandings of right order. Yet, religion does remain a distinctly comprehensive, durable, and generative source of politically relevant understandings of right order, and this potent normative ordering power is what distinguishes political conflict with distinctively religious stakes from ethno-political and ethno-national conflict between parties that are simply identified in religious terms. So I've suggested that some forms of political conflict involve distinctively religious stakes. But now for the remainder of my lecture, I want to suggest some ways in which religiously informed political conflict and violence and from here on, I'll be focusing on violent conflict. I want to focus on some ways in which religiously informed political violence can be sustained by a distinctive matrix of modalities and mechanisms. So I'm going to identify and then comment on six modalities and mechanisms. I'm going to begin by itemizing them just to give you a roadmap of where I'll be going. The first is the social production of what I call hyper-committed selves. The second is the cognitive and affective construction of extreme otherhood and urgent threat. The third is the mobilization of specifically religious rewards, sanctions, justifications, obligations, and ultimate meanings. The fourth is the experience of profanation. The fifth is the translocal expandability of conflict, and the last is the incentives generated by decentralized and what I call hyper-competitive religious fields. Now before talking about each of these, I'm going to note two caveats about this set of modalities and mechanisms. First, this is not a systematic typology. It's in no sense an exhaustive list of mechanisms. It's exploratory and illustrative. And secondly, these are not specific mechanisms uh, each designates a broad class of modalities, mechanisms, and processes. And I'm not necessarily wedded to the term mechanisms. So let me begin then with the first mechanism, which is what I call the social production of hyper-committed selves. By hyper-committed selves, I mean selves constituted by radical and uncompromising forms of commitment to a political, moral, or religious cause. The cause is understood as an unconditional and absolute value, not just as one good among others. It's an example of what Max Weber called a Gesinnungsethik, an ethic of conviction or an ethic of ultimate ends. 
The ethic of conviction uh, for Weber was characterized by indifference to the consequences of action, as illustrated by the maxim which Weber quoted, the Christian acts rightly and leaves the outcome to God. Now, hypercommitment need not entail violence. The cause to which one is committed may even expressly repudiate violence, but there's an affinity, I would argue, between hypercommitment on the one hand and intransigence and violence on the other. The indifference to consequences can facilitate both the suffering and the inflicting of violence. It does so by suspending ordinary forms of moral accounting and everyday sensitivity to risk and harm in the name of an overriding concern with the one thing that matters. At the limit, this may, may entail indifference to the possibility or even to the certainty of one's own death or indifference to the deaths of others. This discounting of consequences is, of course, the source of the extreme moral ambivalence of hypercommitment, which can enable both self-sacrificing forms of moral heroism and self-righteous forms of, radical, of morally sanctified violence. Now, there's of course nothing uniquely religious about radical and uncompromising commitment to a cause. The paradigmatic ethic of conviction for Max Weber was religious, but in his great lecture, Politics as a Vocation, delivered in January 1919 during the turmoil of the November Revolution, Weber was more concerned with secular forms and specifically with revolutionary syndicalism. And all high-risk secular collective action requires commitment. It requires the discounting of risk. Still, religion's formally formidable socializing and world-defining powers make it a robust and productive source of hypercommitted selves. The power to transform selves and subjectivities and to define reality comes into focus most clearly in the case of conversion to a, a new and more demanding form of religious engagement. By conversion, I don't necessarily mean conversion from one religious affiliation or category to another, but rather from one often merely nominal mode of religious engagement or non-engagement to another demanding one. Conversion of this nature can entail a fundamental shift in identity, the sense of being born again or starting one's life anew. It can involve a rupture in the way of seeing and experiencing the world, a relativization and devaluation of existing social ties, a powerful cognitive, emotional, moral, and even bodily re-socialization. Now, of course, certain secular organizations and movements also employ techniques of re-socialization in their efforts to produce highly committed members, and commitment can intensify and crystallize in the course of unfolding struggles. But religion is a particularly potent matrix of the profound and durable reorganization of the self. Now, conversion, of course, does not always produce a hyper-committed self. Religious commitment shades over into hyper-commitment only at the extreme endpoint of a continuum. But the logic of what Weber called heroic or virtuoso religiosity, premised on an implicitly comparative and competitive frame within which claims can be made for exceptional status on the basis of their exceptional religious performance, this logic makes hypercommitment an imminent and ever recurring possibility. And when hypercommitment is generated, it can contribute to uncompromising, high risk, and violent forms of political action. The second mechanism is the construction of extreme otherhood and urgent threat. Now, of course, the construction of otherhood is a general social, cultural, political process. It's not a distinctively religious one. And while religion is implicated in the construction of otherhood, it's also involved in transcending divisions and constructing universalistic forms of solidarity. So here again, one sees what R. Scott Appleby calls the ambivalence of the sacred. Yet, religion affords a distinctively potent, flexible, authoritative, renewable, transposable, and mutually reinforcing set of resources, resources that are at once symbolic, discursive, ritual, and organizational for constructing 
extreme forms of otherhood that can facilitate and legitimize violence. As authoritative systems of classification, many religious traditions contain specifically religious categories of extreme otherhood, heretic, apostate, infidel, and so on. And they specify procedures such as excommunication or in the Muslim world, takfir, for placing persons in these categories. And they justify and authorize violence in certain contexts against members of these categories. Now, of course, all religious traditions are internally contradictory and justifications of violence stand in tension with other provisions, but categories of religiously legitimated and religiously defined extreme otherhood and justifications for violence against such others remain available as a potent discursive resource. Religious traditions also contain elaborate and distinctive resources for constructing urgent threats and mobilizing and legitimizing action against them. Idioms of sacralization and profanation, of cosmological good and evil, of divinely sanctioned mission or holy war, of imminent catastrophe or millenarian transformation. These idioms can be enlisted to raise the stakes. Judgments pronounced by religious authorities can enjoin action, including violent action, to respond to these threats. And by religious authorities, of course, I mean not only mainstream authorities, but also, and today especially, all those who claim to speak with religious authority, even when their authority is rejected by the overwhelming majority of mainstream religious authorities. And more on this issue of authority in a moment. More generally, religious understandings of transcendent reality offer powerful leverage for radically devaluing the existing social and political order and for legitimizing programs of radical reconstruction which may encourage or require violence. Michael Walzer, for example, famously characterized Puritanism as the template for all forms of social revolution, while Shmuel Eisenstadt traced the origins of what he called totalistic or Jacobin forms of radical politics to the transposition of transcendental religious visions generated by axial age civilizations from restricted and marginal spaces into the center of politics. More generally still, the charismatic or prophetic moment in religion, like charismatic authority in general, is intrinsically disruptive or even revolutionary, as Max Weber again argued, and it's no accident that both Walzer and Eisenstadt were deeply influenced by Weber. Of course, religious understandings of transcendent reality can also be mobilized against challenges to the existing social and political order, and they can be used to legitimize the violent repression of challenges and challengers. I turn now to the third mechanism, and this is the mobilization of rewards, sanctions, justifications, obligations, and what might be called deep, ultimate, or constitutive meanings. This too is of course a generic social process, yet religious entrepreneurs and organizations, or the political entrepreneurs who speak the language of religion, may be able to mobilize an additional layer of rewards, sanctions, justifications, obligations, and ultimate meanings. This is suggested, I think, most clearly by the spectacular surge since 2000 in religiously legitimated or rationalized suicide attacks. Now, as political scientists have noted, specifically religious rewards and justifications are neither necessary for the recruitment of suicide attackers, as shown by the anti-religious Tamil Tigers pioneering an extensive use of the tactic, nor are they obviously sufficient, as shown by the fact that suicide attacks are overwhelmingly concentrated in a small number of theaters of conflict. Yet religious justifications can transform such attacks from religiously prohibited suicide into religiously sanctioned martyrdom rewarded in the afterlife where the sins of the martyr who has died for the sake of God will be washed away. Now, martyrdom too has become a secular category, and in some contexts, this is especially the case in Israel, the occupied territories, and Lebanon, strong social support for suicide bombers has led to their celebration as secular heroes. 
But while suicide bombing in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been intensively studied, that conflict accounts for only 4% of post-2000 suicide attacks. In Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, where more than 80% of post-2000 attacks have occurred, specifically religious rewards for martyrdom would appear to count for more in recruitment, especially in Pakistan and post-2011 Iraq, where suicide bombings uh, have not involved the struggle against foreign occupation that political scientists have emphasized. Political scientists have tended to discount such religious rewards and justifications. For most political scientists, religion provides an ex post rationalization and justification for conduct that can be explained in non-religious terms. Now, if our aim is to explain organizational strategies and tactics, there's a lot to be said for this skepticism. But if our aim is to understand individuals' willingness to volunteer for suicide missions, then the dismissal of religion seems to me less persuasive. The rationality and intelligibility of suicide bombings for organizations is one thing. Its rationality and intelligibility for individuals who volunteer to sacrifice themselves is another. The religious legitimations that may serve as ex post rationalizations and justifications for organizations may operate as ex-ante motivations for individuals or at least as ex-ante forms of sense-making, of meaning-making that give suicide missions a larger meaning and purpose. So what is opportunistically employed and certainly cynically manipulated by organizations may at the same time be deeply and sincerely felt by individual recruits. I turn now then to the fourth mechanism. This is the experience of profanation. Now, if one takes the categories sacred and profane in a broad Durkheimian sense, then sacred objects are simply those that are set apart, those that must be treated with special respect. And profanation then is simply an experienced or claimed violation of the required respect. And such profanation in the broadest sense that is, in the form of perceived disrespect towards special objects, special places, special activities, can generate a violent response in many contexts that are not substantively religious. But here, I'm interested in profanation in a narrow, more narrower and more substantively religious sense. Violence can be provoked by deliberate attempts to desecrate the central symbols of another religion, such as Florida pastor Terry Jones's burning of a Quran in March 2011, but a religious profanation can also be experienced without having been intended as such. This doesn't have to lead to violence. Outrage at a perceived profanation may be channeled into peaceful protest or into institutional politics, but it may also take extra institutional and sometimes violent forms as in the threats to Salman Rushdie's life, the bombing of bookstores after the publication of the Satanic Verses, uh, as in the riots in response to the cartoons published by a Danish newspaper in 2005, and of course, as in uh, the Charlie Hebdo massacre of last year. The fifth mechanism uh, concerns the translocal expandability of violent religious conflict. As a powerful form of imagined community that cuts across state boundaries, religion can serve as a vector of conflict expansion. The most spectacular recent instance of this has involved the participation of large numbers of Muslim foreign fighters in Afghanistan, Bosnia, Iraq, and Syria. And I want to note five things about this mobilization. The first is its global rather than merely regional nature. The second is the bottom-up mobilization of foreign fighters, at least in the earlier phases. This distinguishes their participation from state-led transborder interventions, though of course there's also more recently massive state-led transborder intervention in Syria. The third is the salience of ideal and not just material or not even especially material interests. At least in the earlier stages of the Syrian conflict, most foreign fighters were not paid, at least not very much, and they could not and cannot expect opportunities, say, for looting that have motivated other forms of transborder military adventurism. The fourth is the discursive framing of transborder fighting as an individual religious duty by certain 
influential clerics invoking the classical distinction in Islamic jurisprudence between matters that are obligatory for each Muslim individually and those that are obligatory for the community of believers as a whole. Now, this is of course the position of only a very small minority of Muslim clerics and it's repudiated by the great majority, but this clerical sanction, even if minoritarian, has helped to motivate and legitimate the participation of those who are receptive to the pan Islamist discourse that highlights the urgent existential threat faced by the global Muslim Ummah. And the last aspect of contemporary foreign fighter involvement uh, is the willingness to fight rather than simply contribute financially at a safe distance. And this distinguishes foreign fighters from say ethnic diaspora financial support for distant nationalist movements and insurgencies such as those of the Tamil Tigers, the PKK and the IRA. In short, the contemporary mobilization of foreign fighters draws on a deeply, though of course unevenly felt, sense of personal religious obligation to defend the global imagined community of the Ummah against a vividly felt existential threat. Now the sixth and final mechanism uh, is a bit in a different category. This concerns the structure of religious fields decentralized and what I call hyper-competitive religious fields, I want to argue, can generate structural incentives for radicalization that can foster intransigent and sometimes violent religious and political action. Now this was true of the post-Reformation wars of religion in 16th and century, 17th century Europe, and a similar dynamic, I would suggest, is at work today in the fragmented and hyper-competitive field of contemporary Sunni Islam. The religious field of Sunni Islam has always been decentralized, but fragmentation and struggles over authority have intensified in the last century as mass education and new media have deeply undermined the authority of the traditionally educated ulama, or legal scholars, and created space for large numbers of new interpreters to claim the right to speak in the name of Islam. Now, in the theoretical language of Pierre Bourdieu, uh, fields generate incentives for different kinds of position taking for those who occupy different positions. So those who possess little of the most established, the most consecrated forms of what Bourdieu calls field-specific capital. So in the field of Sunni Islam, this would be those without the deep jurisprudential knowledge of the ulama. These outsiders seek to valorize new forms of capital. They're structurally disposed towards heteronomy, what Bourdieu would call heteronomy, and that means towards opening up the religious field to forms of capital, to principles of valuation, to resources derived from other fields, not, that is, to, not specifically religious capital. So what does this mean? It may mean political or even mi military capital on the one hand, uh, and the capital of notoriety or fame or media exposure on the other. And these outsiders, those without the specific, specifically religious capital, the outsiders are also structurally disposed towards strategies of outbidding in which they claim to be more truly Islamic than others and towards strategies of provocation intended to gain visibility and recognition. Again, this mechanism is not a specifically religious one. New entrants to all fields, not just religious ones, are structurally disposed towards heteronomy, towards outbidding, towards provocation, precisely because they lack the consecrated, the established forms of field-specific capital, they seek to valorize new forms of capital. But in the hyper-competitive and fragmented field of Sunni Islam, with no structures in place for the authoritative regulation or moderation of internal conflict and competition, these general structural tendencies are accentuated. Now these structural incentives for heteronomy, for provocation, for outbidding in the religious field align with structural incentives for heteronomy in the political field. And I think this is the case in parts of the Middle East today where regimes have been defined in the, say, the last 50 years of their history by a twofold exclusion, which is at once religious, that is, religious exclusion on the part of repressively secularist regimes, so religious on the one hand and ethno-religious exclusion on the other on the part of sub substantively ethnocratic regimes. And then when you throw into the mix 
what can be represented as the neo-imperial involvement of Christian powers, you get strong incentives to religionize political competition and conflict. And by that, I mean incentives to frame political questions as religious questions, to use religious language as an instrument of political mobilization. So there are few and ineffective institutional arrangements to protect politics and the autonomy of politics from religion, um, and there are few and ineffective institutional arrangements to protect religion and the autonomy of religion from politics, and specifically from entanglement in struggles for control over the means of violence. So let me conclude. None of the modalities and mechanisms that I've discussed is unique to religion, but religion provides a distinctively rich and interlocking matrix of such modalities and mechanisms. Strong forms of religious exceptionalism are easily rejected, but the strongly generalizing counterclaim that there's nothing distinctively religious about religiously informed political conflict and violence, I find equally unsatisfactory. Religion can define reality, constitute communities, nurture powerful emotions, generate commitments, re-socialize and reorganize the self, radically devalue the existing order, impose obligations, offer rewards and sanctions, furnish justifications, and intensify threats and danger. It links cognitive de definitions of ultimate reality with structures of feeling and obligation. And in so doing, it can authorize, legitimize, enable, and in some circumstances, even require violent action in the face of urgent threats, profanations of ex sacred symbols, and extreme otherhood. Now, the fact that religion can do so does not mean that it will do so. And the very same mechanisms that enable religiously informed political conflict to turn violent can also enable powerful forms of nonviolent, solidaristic, or humanitarian social action. The social production of hyper-committed selves can nurture moral heroism. The construction of urgent threats can radically delegitimize social evils such as exploitation, slavery, or war itself. Transnational religion can serve as a vector of expansion of humanitarian campaigns, as it did in the case of the anti-slavery movement in the 19th century. And fragmented and hyper-competitive religious fields may generate stances, such as that of the Quakers, that categorically reject violence. So there's no intrinsic connection between religion or between any particular form of religion and political violence. But religion does provide a potent assemblage of moral, ideological, and organizational resources that in certain contexts can inform, legitimate, or sustain violent conflict, just as they can, in other contexts, inform, legitimate, or sustain the most admirable forms of moral and political engagement. The analytical challenge, then, for students of conflict and violence is to specify the conditions and contexts in which particular religious practices, discourses, fields, organizations, and structures of sentiment can contribute to the production, reproduction, and transformation of political conflict and violence. Taking up that challenge is beyond the scope of this lecture. Doing so would require a different mode of analysis, at once historical, comparative, and contextual, geared toward specifying when, how, why, and where the modalities, mechanisms, and dynamics outlined here uh, are activated in ways that play into political conflict and violence. So my aim in this lecture has been a more modest one to contribute to the development of a more nuanced and qualified particularizing account of the distinctive ways in which religion can enter into political conflict and violence. This kind of qualified particularizing account I've suggested should be understood as a complement to, not as a substitute for a generalizing account we should be attuned to the distinctively religious stakes of some political conflicts informed by distinctively religious understandings of right order that are expressed in claims for the substantive regulation of public life in accordance with religious principles. And we should also be sensitive to the distinctiveness of religion as a rich matrix of interlocking modalities and mechanisms that in some contexts can contribute to political conflict and violence, even when the stakes of the conflict are not 
distinctively religious. But at the same time, we should recognize the ways in which many putatively religious conflicts or conflicts in which parties are identified in religious terms are not distinctively religious, but are fundamentally similar in structure and dynamics to other conflicts over political power, economic resources, symbolic recognition, or cultural reproduction. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues from near and far, dear friends, allow me to first thank Professor Brubaker for his fascinating uh, lecture on, top, on uh, the topic of religious dimensions of political conflict and violence, uh, which is uh, very important not only for us as uh, academics, uh, but uh, also for us uh, as members of our communities and uh, as uh, inhabitants of this uh, complicated world. Uh, my name is Petr Riebner. I'm the head of the Institute of Political uh, Studies, uh, which has the honor to organize this uh, conference. And on behalf of our institute uh, and on behalf of all us from the local organizational team, I would like to uh, thank. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, for uh, thank you for coming to Prague, and uh, I would like to welcome you once again in Prague and the. Charles University. If uh, Rogers Brubaker gave us plenty of food for thought with his keynote, uh, my role is here is to invite you something more shallow, but uh, still uh, important. Uh, the, recep the reception that will now follow in all the magnificent uh, uh, rooms on this festive floor. Please uh, take a moment to feel the atmosphere of the building, one of the finest uh, Art Nouveau buildings in Europe. And uh, this uh, beautiful building is crowned uh, by the outstanding decor created uh, by most of the prominent Czech uh, artists, uh, including, uh, for example, Alphonse Mucha or Max Schwabinski. Uh, what is more, uh, this is where the independence of Czechoslovakia was declared in 1918 and where the first negotiation between the Communist Party and the Civic Forum of Václav, Václav Havel uh, took place in 1989. Uh, now I have two technical instructions uh, for you. The first instruction is for everybody, uh, not only due to the historical value of the municipal hall, uh, smoking is here strictly prohibited in all rooms and all corridors. Please don't smoke. The second instruction is for the participants of the ECPR Executive Committee dinner. We will meet at uh, uh, 8.20 at the cloakroom between the ground floor and the first floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, and now please enjoy the venue for the next few hours. And since you are in the Czech Republic, consumption of uh, wine and beer is of course unlimited. Have a nice evening and thank you once again for coming to Prague. Enjoy the 10th General Conference of the ECPR.